Hey, welcome back to The Craft, where we explore what we're learning about the creative process. My name's Colby, and I'm a music producer and product manager. And my name's Carter, and I am a writer and PhD student in the English department at the University of Kentucky. And today, we are diverging from the usual programming and doing an interview. So we're interviewing Cole Isaac today. Uh, Cole is a conscious creative in the realm of Christian hip-hop. He experiments with textures of jazz, funk, soul, synthesizing an innovative and modern sound. With a range of musical influences such as King's Kaleidoscope, Terrence Martin, Nora Jones, Leon Bridges, and Tom Mishk, his work embraces a palette of diverse listeners. His first single, Late Night, soared to over 200,000 streams on Spotify alone, working with creatives from Canada to Turkey to Nigeria and all over the U.S., Cole pushes the boundaries of 21st century global collaboration. His desire to fuse his story with an ever-evolving blends of hip-hop music creates distinctive instrumental and lyrical watermarks for his expanding creative ambitions. Yeah, this was a really great conversation. I've been friends with Cole since around 2016 and have had the opportunity to work on some music with him as well and producing for him. And he's been uh, just a really great friend to me, really great guy all around and an inspiring creative. We've had a lot of great personal conversations about what goes into the process and then kind of got to bring some of this onto the show. So I really enjoyed the conversation. We get into a lot of the details of how he does songwriting and what influences he has, how he got into music and where he's going next. What stood out to you, Carter? Yeah, Cole is a super interesting guy. He's got a distinct you know, creative philosophy that he spent a lot of time thinking about. So we get to get into his approach to the creative life, even beyond his art. Uh, And we also have a great conversation about his creative process. So we talk about songwriting. And I always enjoy hearing creatives talk about that kind of initial process of what gets things rolling. So we have a great conversation about that as well. Yeah. So without further ado, enjoy this interview with Cole Isaac. Are you cool if we just start with like your background creatively, like what what you do, who you are, just intro? Yeah, of course. Man, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, my name is Cole Isaac, and I'm a I'm a conscious creative. That's the title I like going by. I think um, art is best made when when being intentional about it. And uh, yeah, I've been been creating art for as long as I can remember, just in different ways and. Uh, located in Kelowna, BC right now. I uh, grew up in Vancouver, BC, went to school in the States where I met Colby, which was awesome. And yeah, just just out here, I'm a worship leader now full time, but uh, still, you know, making music on the side and pursuing that always. So that's awesome, man. So how did you, so you first got into songwriting and poetry right in high school and then evolved into hip-hop from there and and writing rap specifically like can you walk through maybe a little bit of the early journey for you and yeah yeah, for sure that look like yeah i mean like i listen to a lot of just my parents music right so like Nora jones and jack johnson and you know like Mm. like those those are my main musical trying to think i mean like run dmc was in the mix too and Man, I'm trying to think. Ben Howard, a lot of singer-songwriters, a lot of uh, just really deep thinkers in the kind of music that we were listening to. So I just fell in love with, like, the stories and the words and, um, you know, the emotion that comes from, that you can portray through music. So it was a really natural, I don't know, just way to express myself as I was growing up in... Probably grade, I picked up a guitar in grade eight, but didn't really get into it till like grade 10. But like once I got into it, it was like, I just started writing songs, you know, like it was just natural. Um, So yeah, it's just poetry into singer songwriter music. And then, you know, like there's only so much you can do with singer songwriter music in the sense of like wordplay and I don't know how to say it because I'm definitely not downplaying singer songwriter music, but it's just a different kind of writing uh, when you can mm. fit more words into a song or you're like, hip hop is so versatile in the fact that you can like share a story 
while also like portraying so many meanings behind each bar. And so I, I guess mm -hmm. I just fell in love with that and the, the confidence that I heard a lot of rappers spit with. And I think I just resonated with it and I wanted it. So. So are there like hidden Cole Isaac singer songwriter songs buried out there somewhere? Yeah, I think so. Like SoundCloud probably. I don't know if they're still up. I can't remember. I, I'm pretty diligent about like covering my tracks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's super interesting to me. So walk us, walk me through at least. Uh, when do you think that shift happened? When you were like, okay, singer songwriter can offer me this kind of genre constraints of what I can do. I mean, was it an artist that you heard that was like a light bulb going off or was this kind of like a gradual thing where you're kind of trying it on and it just seems to fit? Yeah, I, th I think it was a gradual thing because like singer songwriter was the easiest and just the most natural thing for me to, to just start off doing playing guitar, playing acoustic guitar and learning how to sing. You know, I don't have like the most natural singing voice like that was learned. And so I just kind of just, that was default, you know, you have an acoustic guitar, you have a voice, what happens? It's singer songwriter music. And then, and kind of like folk-esque. And, but then I, I, like, I was really brought into the world of, you know, creative writing and, you know, metaphors and similes and alliteration and, and using like oxymorons and like all these different literary devices to, to um, paint a picture by one of my high school teachers, Miss Braun. And she just like, I don't know, just equipped me to, <laughs> and encouraged me to like lean into this. And yeah, she was just super encouraging, um, saying I had a gift and, and all these things. And, and I was literally, I just wrote poems in her class and those poems just like the meter and like the way that I wrote naturally was kind of more spoken word rap ish and so that that's kind of where it became hip-hop besides the fact that i just listened to hip-hop all the time but like it was through like physically just writing poetry without any music that the way i would say it and perform the poem it was like i was rapping and then i was like well maybe i should you know, incorporate this with some music and see what happens. And so that was the, that was the transition. Yeah. So how long have you been writing songs then? Whether that's song, like general singer songwriter stuff or rap? Since grade 10 or 11, grade 10, probably. Okay. So probably 10 years. We're going to break this interview into three main sections around our four creative principles. The first section covers the first two, create and revise and then share and sustain. And so for this first, I would love to just dive straight into like what we love talking about on this podcast, which is just creative process. Yeah, and sure. so you're talking about songwriting and transitioning from doing the singer songwriter thing to writing rap. And so I'm curious what kind of several questions first is what does your creative process look like today? But then also maybe you could share how that's different from 10 years ago, Cole, starting out, you know, writing poetry in high school. Yeah, I think I was just super experimental to begin with because I was just trying to find my voice. And in a way, I don't know if, I hear this in different artists, like my favorite artists, as years go on, they just become confident in everything they do. And I think that that's when you're actually finding your voice is when you're just fully confident and it's just natural. And I don't think that's necessarily, I, th I think my understanding of finding your voice has been a, what key is good for you? What, uh, what kind of music are you making? What, mm -hmm. what kind of content are you discussing and diving into? And like, what is your persona? I think all that stuff doesn't actually have to do with finding your voice. I think finding your voice is just just being comfortable in your own skin, like like mm. legitimately fully comfortable in your own skin. And so I, I'm definitely still on that journey, but I mean, I've never been more comfortable than I am right now. And so, 
like I think at the beginning it was just super uncomfortable because it was just experimenting and you know like it's a story that I know my mom doesn't like but you know like the first time I was I was recording I think it was I think do you remember the God's Hand EP that I dropped like first year of college Colby Oh yeah, I do. You do? Yep. Yeah. So I was recording I, I, I was that. recording that winter of like my first semester of college and my mom walks in and it was like the first time she heard me recording hip hop music and she was like what is this? Like she was so confused and like she she mistook my like cadence and like performance with the way that I was talking. You know what I'm saying? And she was like this doesn't sound like you. Like it because like it, it's very different than singing a song, right? When I sing, it doesn't sound like me how I talk in the same way as when I rap. Mm-hmm. It doesn't sound like me the way I talk. It actually sounds more like me when I rap than when I sing, <laughs> ironically. But, sure. yeah. you know, she was like taken aback and, and kind of like was like, what are you doing? Like you're pretending to be someone you're not. And so I kind of went through an identity crisis there where, you know, I brought it to this kind of like – a cliche, maybe not a cliche thing. I think a very appropriate thing, um, as I recognize from a young age that I'm a guest in the culture, like uh, of hip hop music as a white artist. Like I'm, I'm a guest, mm-hmm. and so I brought it to like one of my mentors who was black, and he was a rapper as well, and um, he just like just affirmed me. He's like, dude, you're like the most natural. <laughs> you're like the most natural white boy rapper that I've heard. You know, <laughs> like in our city because he's like, I know you and I know that this is something that you just bleed and you love and like, you're really not trying to be anybody you're not. Mm. And like, that's all I needed to hear. So yeah, that, 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 that's what, you know, was the breaking point. So I was like, if he says anything remotely close to what my mom said of like, this is not you, you're trying to be someone you're not, I'm done. I quit. You know, like I just needed his validation. So shout out Jake G. Jay Goodward is his rap name. <laughs> he doesn't really rap anymore, but he's uh, like one of the best word wordsmiths I know. So yeah, shout out to him. I can't even remember the question. I just kind of took a trip. Yeah, that's so interesting because we've talked about finding your voice on the podcast before. And I think yeah. in some ways it's difficult, right? Because there's the person that you want to be, right? The persona that you want to create that actually doesn't exist yet. Right. Mm. So there's in some ways, I think imposter syndrome comes to people uh, where they feel like they're being inauthentic in a way. But I don't know. Do you distinguish? Is there a way that we can kind of parse out a posturing that's inauthentic versus a, I don't know, adopting a stage performance? Because you're always performing, right? There's always some sort of sense of. I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Of like, how do we how do we differentiate like someone who's who's posturing versus someone who's maybe trying to fulfill a vision for their artistic persona? Or, I don't know anything in that ballpark. Yeah, hundred percent. It happens. People do it all the time, especially in rap music. You know, you talk about guns and violence and and murder and drugs and like and cars that you don't even have. Like that is, happens all the time. It's like huge. And so I think for me to rap about like growing up in the hood and growing up like with guns or anything like that, like that would just be fake, you know, like I'm going to talk about what I know. So I think a lot of it just comes with your content uh, for one and, and how authentic you're being is like talking about the content, talking about things that you actually know, talking about things that you are a part of like your identity and what make you who you are. And then the performance aspect of that is I think just confidence, man. I think like as a worship leader, I think a lot about what is going to lift up the words that I'm singing. Like what, what is going to like the way that I move my body, the way that I like project my voice, the way that I sing and talk and, raise my hands or whatever, like what is actually going to lift up the words and like the meaning behind the song that I'm singing appropriately and in a way that's going to communicate what I want to communicate. So I'm like, I think that's the same in all of life. (laughs) So if we're just, if we're, if we're thinking through a performance in that mindset, like 
I performed at a show not too long ago. And as I'm preparing, I'm, I'm thinking through like, okay, this song, like what, what am I going to do with each line with my hands, like to help paint the picture of what I'm talking about. So I'm not saying like, I'm sitting in the back seat and like pointing forward, right? It's like I'm sitting in the back seat, you know? So it's like everything ties in together. So I, I see a lot of people, which I just think is unprofessional, you know, just do things that with their hands or like with their the way they perform. And they're just kind of like, it's like, oh, you're faking it because your body yeah. is not matching actually what you're saying. And then further point, if what you're saying isn't matching how you're living, it's not, it's not real. Love that. Mm. Authenticity. Critical. I think that's a good point. And, and it's like, there's a difference between having authenticity in your art and what you do. And ha- being authentic doesn't mean you can never like try. Cause it's like, if you haven't done something before, there's going to be a level of like potential failure or not doing it right the first time or whatever. And that doesn't mean that you're like fake cause you can't just do something perfectly. Yeah. Um, that's helpful for me to like think through, you know, cause I mean, when you first did that project that I could see those, those words from your mom kind of like throwing a wrench in like you being like, well, what are my motives for this? And is, you know, who am I in all of this? And is this really something I can do authentically? And maybe at first there was a level of you just having to step into something you hadn't done before. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like too. There's, I mean, at least in my own work, there's a difference between bad and fake, right? You can you can write a lot of bad poetry, but it doesn't mean that you've somehow crossed over into a line of being fake, right? I, I think that yeah. I think it's always helpful to distinguish of like, yeah, you can have. Uh, there's an Oscar Wilde quote that says something like, "Like earnestness is like the one common denominator in all bad poetry. Like it's all super earnest, <laughs> right? Uh, but it hasn't it hasn't gained that that level of those diction things you're talking about, right? It's not yeah. complex, and then it brings you in with metaphor and simile. So, yeah, Colby, I agree with you on that. Like I think there's there's a yeah. way in which you could do a bad project, but it'd be completely authentic. And there's a way that you could do a good project and probably be posing in a, in a poor way. Hmm. Bro, that's like, that's pop culture. So many people just fake it till they make it like actually, but like to speak the other way, it's like, man, I got so much respect for somebody who is just being a hundred percent authentic in that area of their life, I'm like, yes, I respect you because you're authentic, but like your art sucks. <laughs> like your music sucks. <laughs> like it's not good. You got to work on the excellence piece. Yeah. You got to work on the performance. You got to practice these things. You can't just come out here and just be you. Like that's not. Authenticity is not just good art. Yeah. Authenticity isn't good art. Like it's just authenticity. So I respect you as a person for being authentic, but I don't respect you as an artist because you don't care about excellence. Hmm. you know so yeah, like good. there's there's definitely there's definitely a balance and a tension that needs to be uh worked through 100 percent. definitely no that's really that's really good this may be an unfair question and we'll probably ask you a bunch of unfair questions in this interview nice. it's Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, go. but do you do you find yourself gradually working through songs in that it's an iterative process now i'm not talking about revision yet i'm talking about do they seem to come in as a whole or do they come in little bits of pieces because i feel like i've heard especially with like songwriting like sometimes you'll hear i mean dylan has said like he's just written i think it was like a rolling stone in like 15 minutes or something like it just it, like it comes and then it's there but yeah. i'm sure there's a like or do you find that you're like pulling pieces together more like are different things coming together or do you think that typically you get full visions for a song or is it typically like a gradual thing that you've got to kind of purposely start building up on these little smaller blocks? Um, yeah. So feel free to do whatever you want with that. But I guess two things there: like how how do they how do those bits come to you? I can work through some of my songs. Like college freestyle was like kind of a freestyle. I was just writing. It was like ten minutes, fifteen minutes, and it was done. And it was just played the beat and wrote and it was it uh i mean a super short song but 
Complex. That one. I, I sent you Complex, right, Carter? I think that so. One's, that one's about, like, you, the past two years, you know, like, miscarriages uh, that Michelle and I went through, you know, the loneliness and COVID and just, like, the, you know, just the struggle of um, feeling out of touch. And, um, yeah, that one I wrote in, like, a week, I think, or less. I think it was like three days, like three days straight. I just wrote it. And so sometimes, sometimes th- those things happen like so fast because it's such like, it's such an important uh, moment to capture and they just get written. Um, and then sometimes like, like come through is another track. I think uh, Colby. Behind that's when it. I def. That's when you definitely sent me. I'm not sure about the yeah. last one, but that's when I definitely heard. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so that one was probably, that one went through like multiple beats, multiple, like verses. I think I rewrote that song probably four times. Right, Colby. Probably. I'm pretty sure that's the song that Colby was like, "Sick, we're done." And I'm like, "No, we're not." <laughs> and I like re- rewrote verse one like three times, rewrote verse two like four times, like. You know, it was just, I was just never satisfied until it was like, and, um, yeah. So most of my songs are more like that. I definitely go back and edit and I'm very like picky with the lines that I write, but as of more, more recently, I've been way more, I think it it comes with growth too, but I've just been way more, um, just in a flow state and able to write things that I enjoy quicker and I'm not so picky about each individual line in the sense of like, I just don't care what people think of me anymore. (laughs) Mm. That might be my downfall too, a little bit. It feels like that's pretty empowering as an artist though, because you can get definitely into a space where you are overthinking every line and then you can't finish any work because you think about it from too many angles. Yeah, I mean, Um, it's definitely been my downfall. So I, I struggle with that line. You know, because I definitely know pride comes into it and just like uh, false self-confidence. It's when I'm operating out of like, I only care what God thinks. And so like, man, I'm a product of opinion, but not yours. I'm a product of opinion of God. And so if I'm making art that glorifies him, man, I'm, I'm complete. My job is done. You know, I'm just like a creator trying to image the creator. That's it. That's awesome. I think we're still in the create realm right now and haven't touched too much on revise, but I mean, you may have already touched on this just now, but how does your faith inform your creative process and when you actually sit down to write and yeah, take that however you want? Yeah. I mean, like right now I'm writing a lot of worship songs and I'm writing a lot of like Um, kind of reverting back to where I started from, like singer-songwriter, just picking up my guitar and starting there. And um, so I'm definitely just more at peace with doing whatever feels right instead of being like, I'm a rapper, I got to make rap songs. Yeah. I'm just kind of like, I'm a creative Mm -hmm. and I'm just going to create. Like, Mm -hmm. and there's no pressure on me. And I've made more art Mm -hmm. recently than I have ever because of that zero pressure I'm putting on myself. Like, mm. yeah, I got so many songs that are just just starting to be written or finished and just haven't come out or whatever. And so mm. it's a good space. Did not answer your question. I, I can't remember why I went. Oh, I'm, I've been writing a lot of worship songs. So, like, I've just been inspired by, you know, what I'm reading in, in the Bible. And so, I mean, there's so much wisdom, like, non-Christians take from it all the time, you know, like, especially in hip-hop. You know, people are referencing Mm. scripture all the time. So it's like, and like Bible stories and whatever. So I think it's just a huge uh, cultural inspiration. Like it's, it's literature and, uh, and I'm very inspired by it, especially because I believe it carries a lot of power. So, I mean, carry a lot of inspiration through scripture and like different verses I read, but like, Actively in my creative process, I'm just thinking about, you know, how can I glorify God with the words and the stories and the, you know, the things I'm talking about? Like, is it bringing people together? 
you know, I've written a lot of like macho hip hop, you know, I'm better than you type songs. And like none of them have come out because I just can't, I can't get past the fact that like, I'm just lifting myself up and above other people, you know, like that's just not, that's not it. Who has inspired you the most in your craft recently? I know you talked a little bit about, you know, the music you listened to growing up and that influencing how you, you were writing things in high school, but what are some recent inspirations? And that can be also it, like on the side of stuff you listen to and get inspired by or people whose process or whatever inspires you just as a whole. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Dinner Party is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, you know that project? Terrence Martin, Robert Glasper, Kamazi Washington, Ninth Wonder. Insane. They have a bunch of collabs on it. Like, um, I think I think her name's Phoenix. Uh, Aunt Clemen- mm-hmm. Clemens. I'm, I'm going to mispronounce their names. But the four guys got this, got together. I mean, they're all legends individually. So you get four legends together and like they make this dinner party, they call themselves. First EP was just self-titled. And then the second one just came out like two days ago. And I listened to it for the first time this morning with my child as I'm changing diapers. <laughs> and uh, Amazing. Man, it's just like such excellent music, you know, very Berkeley like music for musicians. Mm. And like, it's crazy. I mean, I'm inspired. I mean, shout out Joe Michael, uh, one of my close friends and collaborators. Uh, he's on a couple of my tracks. And uh, we did a track together. College Freestyle was us together. Uh, he produced mm-hmm. that and and I think he mixed it as well. And he plays flute. But he just played in a session with uh, Terrence Martin, I think. And uh, like a oh, couple wow. other guys. I think Kamazi Washington was there too. Insane. So I'm like, I'm super inspired by Jamichael. Got to see him in LA um, a few weeks ago. Actually, I was down there. And uh, I'm inspired by him. I mean, I'm inspired by 538th Street. They're this band from, there's two brothers from Kelowna where I'm living right now. I just met them on Instagram. I just hit up a few guys when I moved here because I was just trying to make friends and uh, we became like best friends. So they're definitely, you know, my closest, some of my closest friends here and I'm super inspired by them. Got the honor of managing them for the past six months and yeah, they're, they're insanely talented um, and they just like bleed songs. They have so many songs that my biggest frustration as their manager was that they wouldn't release music and uh, they're still not releasing them because I got them to release two songs when I was managing them. <laughs> that's my that's my biggest accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> just like getting them out there. They're crazy talented and I'm so excited for what they're doing. Those are some people that I'm super inspired by right now locally and and far away. I love that. That's a perfect point to jump into sharing your work. I think the, you know, we didn't touch too much on revise and the revision process of your work. Uh, So if we have anything, we can go back to that. But sharing your work is definitely a bit of like a, there's so much to talk that we could talk about. I know we've had a lot of personal conversations about it, like marketing side of things. And then just when do you know something is released or ready to be released and Mm -hmm. like, give it the stamp of approval. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious if there's anything that immediately like jumps out to you that you want to talk about in this category. If not, I mean, I just have a couple general questions, but I guess like what's your experience been like so far with sharing your work and what are you, where are you at with that right now? I love sharing my work. It's a quote somewhere. I don't know who said it. Somebody said music never lives until it's been released or something like that. And like, I, I think that's true. Like, I think it's true. You know, I'm not like confident that it's true, but I think it's true. And so, I, cause I really feel that way. Anytime I have a song, like I'll forget it if I don't put it out, you know? Like it just becomes, it just becomes nothing over time. But when you release it into the world and like other people have access to it, like one, you're giving a gift to the world. Like there's there's someone that will appreciate that and be touched by it. And um, so I think it's a little bit selfish for artists who just like make a bunch of music and never release it. Shout out 538 Street, release your music. <laughs> and um, 
you know, like I legit though, like I do think it's selfish to not put it out there because like your music will bless people and and I don't know, we've been given a we've been given gifts to like give back. So that's just kind of my philosophy on that, I guess. Like music doesn't yeah, I think I would agree with that. Music doesn't live until until it's released. So then how do you know when something is is ready to get that stamp of approval and is ready to be released to the world? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a big debate. I don't know. I mean it's gotta be mixed and mastered. <laughs> that's like <laughs> For like sure. the simple yeah yeah you know it's just like just finish the song i don't know like it's so hard because there's you can always make tweaks it's just when sure. it feels right like when it feels right and for some people you know it it takes forever for it to actually feel right but like man i really think it's better to like just get it out there especially if you're like okay i've spent my time on this song like i'm gonna start working on other stuff great yeah. release that Whatever you have, just release yeah. it. Like, have you heard of this guy, Nick D? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yo, because he started a YouTube channel and he's like putting on like putting putting on all these like young artists who are trying to like, you know, get game and, and learn and and, you know, make a career out of just releasing music. He's and, a songwriter, right? And like like he does Instagram stuff. I think that's where I saw him first was like, yeah, playing doing like playing his songs live on Instagram. Yep. With his mic and he's stuff. like doing a little dance or like whatever does it like on the roof of his house or yeah, whatever yeah, just crazy exactly. stuff like that yeah and he's gone viral and because yeah. he's released a song a week for the past like two years sheesh insane and now he's like collaborating and he collaborates with people all the time because people like mm -hmm. see him and they're like man i want to jump on that because he gets almost a million streams on every single song do you know how mm -hmm. much bank that is <laughs> A million streams on every song you release if you're dropping a song a week. Like, that's wild. That's solid. Yeah. Wild. And then think about the ones that are hits because those are 20 million. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Crazy. Yeah, and I feel like, I feel like too, it's like there's a point where, and I think this goes right along with this conversation, you can't overwork stuff. I mean, there's, I mean, I think there's yeah. points where like our inclinations are, it hasn't been revised through, th you know, so I think Hemingway wrote the end of A Farewell to Arms like 30 sometimes. And there is work that needs to get revised, wow. right? Before it's like you said, Cole, like before yeah. you feel good about it. But at some point it's like, maybe you've got the right words when it, when you first put it down. Yeah, and I totally. think that. There's a way in which sometimes, I don't know, we almost feel guilty, or at least I do, if something sounds right the first time. It's like, well, yeah. maybe it's not ready yet, but it, it okay, maybe. Yep. But also it might be ready to go. Uh, mm -hmm. And then messing it is going to do something where, I don't know, you can feel when it gets overworked. Like it, whatever oh, yeah. was natural or spontaneous about it somehow feels, I don't know, you can see the fingerprint too much <laughs> or you can kind of see where it i don't know it loses whatever that spontaneity was totally one of my mentors damien who was also my barber in college he said that to me you know he's like your mm. your your writing sounds too like formulated and too Interesting. like you know like perfect you know it's like you got that perfect rhyme scheme you got that perfect meter you know like you're saying yeah, you like you're rapping it perfectly. Where is your personality? And I was like, damn, you know, mm -hmm. like he was like, he's like, where is your personality? I don't hear it. This is a love song. It doesn't sound like a love song. I was like, oh, so good, and, you know. And it's mm -hmm. like super yeah. helpful. That changed my music moving forward. Because I remember he, that happening. Yeah, and I was like, I just got roasted, but also, like. He spent two hours with me just listening to like DMX and like some other rappers and being like, listen to how he tells his story because his rhyme schemes and his words and like whatever is not like perfect. And it's not like, you know, it's not all just like super calculated like you're doing. He's got some of that, but 
why do people love him? Because like his personality and it comes out mm -hmm. and like the way he raps really does sound like you're just having a really passionate conversation with him. You know, it's like, man, that's awesome. I love that. I had a, a professor and, and mentor with, with my own poetry say, you know, I, when I've sent him stuff, he would phrase it, and this is very similar, poor poetry is mastered by the requirements of the meter. Good poetry, the poet is in control, right? It's where they break meter. That's the interesting parts anyway, right? So it's like mm. there's a way in which you can write things where you're, you are – you know, you're consumed by the like formal requirements. And it was just one of those shifts. And I, I love that there's a mm. parallel here with this. It's like the poet or the rapper that's in control is okay breaking the meter, is okay breaking the rhyme scheme. Like it, you've got to be able to like violate those things and transgress yeah. those things because otherwise I think you're totally right. It just sounds too stiff. Like, it's like a suit that hasn't been broken in. Like, it just looks wrong. You're like, where are the wrinkles? Yeah. Like, what's going yeah. on here? It's, it's been ironed too much. Yes. The line that came to mind was uh, 21 Pilots. What's your, like, most famous song? And he's like, I wish I didn't have to rhyme every word I sang. And it, like, doesn't rhyme. And it sounds, the first time, I remember the first time I heard it, I was like, what? Like, I was, like, messed up. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> And now I'm like, wow, I love and appreciate that so much. And it's iconic. Mm. Everybody knows mm -hmm. that, you know? Yeah, that's a good line. I forgot about that. Hmm. So where that where is Cole Isaac as an artist today? And what you, you've been talking about, you've been teasing out some some music is on the hard drive. So what what can we expect to be shared soon? We're in feature season right now. Yeah, I'm just trying to do as many features as possible. So... First one's dropping May 5th. Uh, it's with my brother, my little brother, oh, awesome. and my wife's brother, technically. But, man, we're like the same person, I swear. Uh, he's amazing. He's way more talented than me, though. Like, he's producer, singer, rapper, songwriter, all that. He does it all. Drummer. Hmm. Plays guitar. Like, the man's super talented. I got so much respect for him. And, uh, yeah, we... When I was in Miami a few months ago, we just locked in for a week and made three songs. One of them was his song that he already had finished pretty much. And I was like, I love this. Please let me try to throw something on. And I spit a verse and he was, he liked it. And I was like, let's go. <laughs> so awesome. I just kind of like slid in on that one. It's a, it's a hit, man. I'm so excited about that song. We just shot a video. He was just down here last week. Uh, we just shot a little video for that uh, little promo on Instagram. So that's going to be fun. I got a song with 538th Street uh, that we're trying to figure, trying to finish up. Like, you know, it's going to be a struggle getting that one out. But uh, I, I believe that it's going to come out because <laughs> it's it's also a hit. We wrote it in one day. And really? yeah, it was it was actually Jake's birthday that one of the brothers. And so we got the band past and present because you know there's um it's jake and sam are the are the brothers and they're 538 street but then they also have you know a bass player and a drummer join them mm. um mm. and so like there's been a few guys that kind of rotate and, and play different gigs or whatever so it was kind of everyone together in the studio for a whole day and we wrote three songs and uh this second song was the one that that i wrote the hook for and and it's man, it's so fun. Hopefully that's coming out soon. And I got I got a bunch of songs that like I mean the two songs with my brother Colin JJ that are just you know needing to be re-recorded and and a little bit rewritten. And we're kind of starting a recording project. It's very down low right now uh, with my church starting a recording project. So I'm writing for that and you know working with the band on arranging and picking songs and like that's super exciting that's a huge passion project for me um as well and so yeah like there's just lots of there's lots of different projects and i'm not putting any pressure on myself i'm just creating because i love to mm. and so yeah if anybody is listening to this and you know wants a feature from cole isaac <laughs> like you got it if your song's good. <laughs> I don't charge for features. I just, I do it for the love. So 
yeah, if I love the song, I'll do a feature. So awesome. Yeah, I man. hope that we connect you to someone. That'd be amazing. Yeah, that'd be sick. So, well, here's a follow up question on that. I'm I'm just really curious about this. If this has changed over the last couple of years, do you try to set artistic goals for the year? Or do you just try to go through the doors that seem to open? Because for me, mm. I don't know, it's very hard for me to try to set goals like for the year. Like I'm so much more, and this is funny because Colby and I are very different in this. Like I'm so much more of like, what can I do tomorrow morning? Like I have a hard time seeing beyond a couple weeks. Like I'm like, okay, what am I working on right now? What's What's drawing the attention? And this is definitely in some ways, I think, Colby and I have talked about this before, like there's a benefit to that, but there's also like there can be drawbacks to not having this kind of broader intentionality. But for you, do you do you try to set year goals or monthly goals or, or how do you approach yeah. that whole like, you know, am I doing too much right now? Am I not doing enough? Should I be writing more? Should I not be writing more? Like where do I want to be in July? How do you approach that kind of tension? Yeah, man, I've been trying to like, I, I used to be super OCD, like I never got diagnosed, but like, I couldn't go to bed without writing my full day out to like the half an hour. Like it was bad when I was a youth. And so I've like tried to get away from that as much as possible, because my natural like inclination is planning to the T at least two weeks in advance, you know, and so I'm like, I'm very organized, very planned, very scheduled, you know, I can I can like live life with just knowing like, what am I going to do tomorrow? Like, I just couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, that's, that's amazing, sure. Carter. Like, man, God bless your journey. <laughs> I, I could not do that. Like, that would drive me insane. Yeah, it drives my wife insane sometimes, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, my wife is like super spontaneous and like doesn't have, we're complete opposite in that. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm exactly. Very, very exactly. like, I have reminders for everything. Like, if I'm late five minutes, like I'm beating myself up, you know, I'm just like, I'm very, very uptight. Used to be very uptight. I'm, I'm, I'm learning to like relax and I'm really trying to intentionally do that. So, the season I'm in right now is like not having any goals and it's really scary, but it's also really freeing and really like I've seen a lot of progress, but it is, it's sucky and I have to kind of like fight through it all the time because I got multiple songs that are my own, but I'm like, ah, like sure. I just had a kid, like I want to have my priorities straight. You know, I, I've really been intentional with my marriage and spending time with Michelle uh, the past few months and... I really want these next few months to just be like a lot of family time. So that's why I'm like, it's feature season, you know? Yeah. Features, I can write a verse. I can write, you know, and just like record it and send it off. You know, I'll put lots of effort into it, of course. But like, I'm not in control of the final product, you know? That's on them. So hmm. there's so much that goes, like so much less that goes into doing a feature than me trying to finish a song because I, I get live musicians. I get, you know, yeah. I got to go through, I'm super like, got to go through all the checklists. And and so it's a very involved process, but I am very organized. So I think right now in this season, not having goals is a good thing for me. Even not having goals, like I do have goals, but like they're sure. just more broad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's really interesting to hear i mean it's interesting actually carter that you said that because this is a bit of a tangent but i feel like you're more of a big picture vision kind of person and i'm more like checklist organized detail kind of person oh, for sure and i have a harder time like remembering the big picture and then getting super stressed about the details but then <laughs> it's like the opposite where i'm planner and you're more like well, what's going on tomorrow morning or today? What's in front of me at the yeah. same time? That's interesting. Well, oh, it is funny. It's like I've got the the vision of me at 55 and I've got tomorrow morning. And that's like <laughs> what happens in between there is very opaque to me. But mm. yeah, I think you're right in that way. It's like what is the the version of, of who I want to be? What is he doing in the morning? Like, like can I try to do what he would do? And so there is this kind of funny like jump between like big picture ideas and here uh but i also think right you do have to have 
for, let's say, just say a personality type like myself, right? You do, the danger with that is that you do lose track of a way to gauge how you're moving, right? If you don't have kind of some structure where you can recognize, okay, this is actually done, it can lead to a lot of will spinning in which you've got a vision of something and you've got kind of the practical, let's say, motivation to do it today, but it can get very disorientating. I mean, let's just think about mm-hmm. the craft, yeah. for instance. It's like Colby's been great with this podcast about setting up benchmarks. And without those benchmarks, I think it's really easy to get one, I don't know, complacent in it, but two, you just can't really orientate where you're at. And so the benchmarks in that way, having a to-do list, I'm, I'm definitely would benefit from a to-do list. It yeah. can just help because, I don't know, I think it, for, it just lets you check in to see where you are in relationship to the goals. Uh, but yeah, Cole, that's something I feel like, I feel like yeah. we, we talk about that every now and then. Yeah. I think it plays into like a productive piece as well. Mm. Like for me, productivity is like a mini God in my life. You know, like I tend to serve productivity or like efficiency rather than like serving a situation or mm. like a person, you know? Mm-hmm. So like if I'm trying to be productive in my day, I'm going to have a set hour for this. I'm going to have a set hour for that. I'm going to have a, you know, and that's going to affect my wife. It's going to affect my friends. It's going to affect the other people in my life because I'm not serving them. I'm not like thinking about them. I'm thinking about like productivity and that being like a lot of my value is like, if I'm highly productive and highly efficient, then I can, you know, think good about myself. Think that the day was worth it instead of thinking like about the eternal, the eternal goods that are produced in spending time, like sitting down and talking to somebody for two hours, maybe, maybe it was like an hour or half an hour long, longer than I wanted. But it's like, man, like, I'm I'm actually here. And and I'm more present. And I'm like, I care about you as a human and as somebody who's like, going through this life and struggling. And uh, I think just, just being more present sorry stop not focusing so much on productivity allows me to be more present where i'm at Mm. and so that's been like my journey recently and something that i'm like actively trying to work on that's awesome yeah that's very well said i definitely feel that so you've been talking about it's kind of come up a few times that you're you've been in a pretty good flow state recently and pretty productive with your writing I'm very curious, though, what it has been like for you. One, have you hit writer's block? I mean, I know that you have because we've talked (laughs) about it. But uh, have you hit writer's block? What does that look like for you? And then what do you do to get out of that in the past? Yeah, I mean, yeah, everybody's going to hit writer's block. I think the biggest way, the easiest way to get out of writer's block is stop thinking that you have writer's block. You just got to convince yourself that you don't have writer's block. So just sit down and write? (laughs) Yeah, just write. Just write through it or go take a walk and go listen to some music. I think having writer's block only happens to me when I'm like putting pressure on myself to produce something. And so in what we were just talking about, like I'm sitting down in a situation, like am I sitting down to produce a song as a product? Not producing like musically am i trying to have a product out of my writing session or am i just writing to write Mm. you know and like that's what that's the biggest change in me that's that works for me every single time because it's like if i'm writing to write then i succeeded (laughs) and there's no failure because i wrote you know i didn't produce Mm. anything didn't produce anything good like i threw it in the trash but i wrote and I wrote, oh, I, I got it out, you know? Like, a lot of times I just need to get it yeah. out. I need mm-hmm. to, like, I was writing a song with um, Ndukwe the other day uh, when I was in, in Louisville. I keep referencing, I don't travel that much, but I keep referencing, like, <laughs> I was in L.A. the You've other been day. everywhere. Oh, I was no, in Miami. Awesome. I was in Louisville, <laughs> you know? I've traveled a lot since May, actually, which is crazy. So in May, that was almost a year ago. Wow. Yeah. So I was writing a song with Emmanuel, uh, a.k.a. Nduque, on uh, a couple of my tracks. And uh, 
we just started writing this like super depressing song because that was what was on our hearts and our minds. And we just had to get it out, you know? So we wrote this like really depressing song and like, that's not what we wanted to write, but like, that was all that was kind of like, that's how our conversation led towards. And like the things we were feeling because of things that have, that had happened and, and we wrote it and we scrapped it and then we worked on what we actually wanted to work on mm. and, and it worked. It was great. Yeah. Mm. You know? So it's actually really cool that you said that because there's been a concept that I learned about sometime in the past like year that ties directly to that, which is like the difference between lead metrics and lag metrics. So like lead metrics are, or sorry, lag metrics are, you know, like you finish the song or you got a million streams on a song or whatever. And so they don't happen until like all the other pre, you know, work is done. And then the lead metric is like sitting down every day to write a song. And it's like, it doesn't matter what the output is. It's about the input of doing a thing every day or every week. And it's like, if you can focus on the lead of what you're doing week to week and not be so stressed about the output, then it seems like you do like really relieve a lot of pressure off yourself. And you get that sort of like mental, like dopamine hit of like, Hey, I did something like I'm, yeah. I made, I accomplished the goal. Totally. You know? Cole, what was that? Uh, was it John Bellion's got the faucet metaphor that you, you've referenced before? I think it was Ed Sheeran actually. Okay. It was that faucet metaphor. It's like, you've got to let like cathartically something come out and it's mostly rusty at first or, or something that you're yes. not even concerned with. Uh, this is just, it just reminded me, Cole, when you were talking about like yeah, the dirty water. Yeah, or whatever. It, it, there's there's like the pre-process of a, we had to write that sad, depressing song because the other one's not possible until that one happens. Like you're almost yeah. like clearing a blockage almost. 100%. It's a benefit that I get to enjoy because my mm -hmm. income does not come from getting a million streams on every song I release. You know, like the yeah. pressure is not there for me. If I got a million song, streams on every song I release, like that would be awesome. But I would still work the job that I have. You know, like I like love what I do. So I create out of a place just because I love creating. And um, that's changed, you know, like ask me that two years ago and I wouldn't have said that. I'd be like, I'm, I'm trying to get the leg metrics, you know, that's my goal. And if you would have looked at my 2020 goals, like a lot of them were like, have this amount of followers, have this amount of streams, have this amount of, you know, interviews, whatever. Um, because I'm trying to reach a goal of financial stability within my craft. But now I'm just focused on the craft, you know what I'm saying? And I'm just enjoying uh, the benefit of not having to make money off of creating. Uh, so it's a different conversation having it with me than having it with, you know, if you're to interview one of my friends that is actually actively trying to make money off of it, because I'm sure there's going to be stressful moments because I've been there where I'm like, I need to produce a song like this week. I need to be writing a song every single week because you know, if I don't do that, I'm not going to get a solid song that I can release every month, mm -hmm. whatever. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's great. It feels like everyone is going to have writer's block and everyone's going to have to work through that. And you like learning your motivations and what puts you in a place that you're comfortable to write. And for you, it's not, I mean, I feel like for me, it's the same way of when I feel pressure to have to do something that can be a forcing function for good sometimes, but then eventually that pressure turns into overwhelm and you can't, you can't make art from a place of being overwhelmed unless maybe you're writing a really good song about feeling overwhelmed, but oh, <laughs> aside from something like that, you know, I mean, yeah, just, I think that's really good. Yeah. We, you know, I think we touched on sustain. I never like officially pulled us into that. Category, make us official here. Cole. feels like we talked, we definitely talked about, sustaining and pushing through burnout or through writer's block, but maybe anything you're thinking about in, in how, how you're sustaining, you know, as a writer, songwriter, artist for the next two years, five years, 20 years. What is that? Yeah, that's a great question. For you? Sustainability, I think comes with, uh, the love for what you're doing. 
like you think about how many people work a job that they just like hate and like you know the thing that makes it sustainable for them is the paycheck and if your paycheck doesn't continue to increase because while well, your desire to do that job decreases you know that's going to make a difference uh so when you when it comes to doing something that you love like creating music and just writing if we're talking about the craft really simply you know it's cultivating that love because you're not getting paid i'm not getting paid to to write you know so in the moments of frustration or defeat or self doubt or whatever it is it's just like going back to why am i doing this and what do i love about it so that's another reason i i really appreciated managing 538 street is cuz it gave me 6 months to really fall back in love with just creating so yeah mm. that's awesome well that was uh i guess cold too that was uh one of our i think one of the questions was like being a musician do you have to quit your day job? And I think it's a resounding no for you. It's like, I don't know. Oh, it yeah. seems things change when you have to make it profitable. Like, I totally feel that. I, and, you know, maybe this will get into a question, too, of, like, I feel like there's probably a bad way to evaluate artistic merit, and it is once things get quantifiable, I think, right? I mean, when when streams or profitability become the metric that you're gauging things, it just seems like the the cart gets put before the horse in that way, and I think that gets a lot of artists. I mean, we 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 culturally get this of like, oh, they sold out, and that that becomes like kind of this big phrase. But I think there's something that's very like true about that, of like there's a demand, you know. And so in my realm of things, Jack London is one of the guys that I'm writing my dissertation on, and after his big early work. He just needed to make a living, <laughs> and so he just starts cranking out these pot boilers for like five or you know close to a decade of just writing what the editors wanted, and it was kind of soul draining for him. Like it really took a toll on his like art because there was a requirement to pay the bills, and it became these things of yeah, that's your full time job. You get to do it every day, and you think oh, having ten hours a day to work on it's going to be this great thing but it became something that was just like almost stifling for him. And so it's cool to hear you saying like, it's just so productive when some of those imperatives to make things popular or monetarily successful get pulled back. Like it it allows something else to grow in its place. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And that's all I can speak to. I don't know the other side of that. Right. I would be interested to hear, you know, like a deeper conversation about somebody on the other side. It's like, you're getting paid to do this. How do you, like, I mean, there's a lot of sacrifices that are made. I've heard Nick D talk about Mm. it. He doesn't write songs that he likes all the time. You know, like he doesn't like, I I think he said somewhere that he doesn't even like half the songs he he releases. You know, he doesn't actually care about the, the songs like as much as I do. Cause he's just like, I'm a content creator at yeah. the end of the day. I'm a content creator. And once I became, yeah, this is what he said. He's a content creator. And once he became satisfied and content in the fact that he is just, just that, like he's now not a, a musician or an artist that, that does it for the love of the craft. He is now a content creator period, you know? So like everything serves that everything goes through that lens um, because that's how he makes money. And I'm just like, I'd rather not make money. That's so interesting. Cause you have the opposite side of that, which is like, I think there's the, the privilege that, that I also have of like, for me, I would put it as the privilege of obscurity, just like <laughs> not having the and of like not being trying to do this for a living. I don't have to worry about that. But then you have the inverse, like the far extreme of that is like the success and the excellence gets to the level of like Kendrick, who could not put something out for like two or three years in silence. And he doesn't need to do like a reel or TikTok every week. He doesn't need to like keep people engaged. He can just drop an album in two years and we'll still all be waiting. You know what I mean? Because he reached that level of like, okay, we're taking you seriously. And so it's not a, 
And it's like just such a different experience. And then, uh, with it, with way more extreme pressure, but then also like, yeah, I'm sure it's nice. He's not just a content <laughs> creator. Yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah. But it's also a lot of pressure and there's a lot of work that goes in. So it's like, yeah, it's just weird. Well, it's totally different perspectives. Yeah. That's a, that's a perfect example of somebody in my, well, somebody who loves the art and doesn't want to sacrifice that, you know, he's able right. to operate that way, but not many people are. Right. Yeah. I'm curious, what is a piece of bad advice that you hear in your craft? Or maybe put another way, you could take this one of two ways. Or you could shoot, there's two questions. And back up. We like two <laughs> questions you can choose. We from. like these multiple prong complex option create your own adventure <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then like you just leave half of them unanswered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, so the first question would be just it, what's like a piece of bad advice that you hear in your craft or what is a strong opinion that you have about your craft that other people would disagree with? Controversial opinion. Pick your own adventure. Mm. Here's a hot take. I think, I think all art glorifies God. Like all art. Every like everything that is created is imaging the creator in the, in the basic sense that you are just merely creating, you know? So the content of the art, you know, obviously doesn't glorify God all the time. But since glorifying God with everything I do in my life, like that's my purpose. I see I see art through that lens and so I draw from, you know, everyone and I enjoy listening to you all kinds of music. But I don't think that and here's I, here's part two of my hot take is I don't think that I don't think you're reaching your full potential in art until you're actually glorifying God with all of it. And so, you know, to my to my artist friends who are you know, not uh, following Jesus. I'm like, man, I think I respect you for creating. And, you know, because I think that's an innate part of who you are as an image of God. But like, I don't think you'll ever reach your full potential until you actually start glorifying God with, with your art fully, you know, and intentionally. And same thing for those who are following Jesus. If you're not making art, for the glory of God and you're just doing it for yourself, it's not worth anything. That's my hot take. That's a hot take. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I really love that. And I think, too, it's like, you know, we've talked, one of the fun things about the podcast is we get to kind of step back and spend, you know, as, as many years as we want to talking about <laughs> what the craft looks like. But we're always talking about how it's got to be about something that transcends the self, like we've talked about this before of like there's a yeah. there's a there's a style of art that just to me seems so confessional in a way that it never leaves itself it's always self like referential in a way that's you're like it's not it's not subsumed or it's not orientated towards something that gets outside of me and i think that's so I mean, it's just so important. I mean, at least it it, it resounds in my own uh, experience of like until your work can somehow get outside of you and be for something other than you. Yeah, I totally agree. It's going to be handicapped. I mean, even the like kind of ancient yeah. Greeks who were considering like the muse. The muse was the goddess who came to you and gave you the muse, right? It's still not this thing that I create, even if we think kind of Greek paganism. It's something that comes to me, and then when I do it, it's still outside of me. And so whenever yeah. it's like, whenever it gets trapped in us, I think that's just when it gets, I don't know, you can just tell that it it's just turned in on itself to kind of use Luther's mm. kind of phrase. It, it It's always yeah. bent in and that just seems to always, yeah, like, I like how you put that, Cole. Like it, it's not realizing the possibility that it could be. It's not fulfilling the potential. Yeah, for sure. The quote that's been at the top of my mind and 
like it's actually like I have a schedule note and it's like at the top of my schedule and I look at it every day, almost every day, I shouldn't say every day, is the act of making art is declaring what you value and what you fear and vice versa. The act of making art is declaring what you value and what you fear. So what you value and what you fear is the art you're going to create. And I just, I think that's super evident in, uh, in our culture and in our lives. So want to know what you value and what you fear? Look at the art you're creating. And uh, maybe that's the quote of the week. <laughs> uh, yes. I love this because like Hume had the idea of the philosopher that our aesthetic judgments are value judgments. So it's not like, oh, I like to look at this kind of music and you like to look at that kind of music and like, oh, it's all art, it's all good. Like our our aesthetic taste and our judgment don't have any kind of like value or moral like hinge. But like Hume said, no, like actually what you like is always you're making a you're making a claim about what you value. And so He's like, no, they're not actually just like, okay, we have our moral decisions over here, and then our artistic decisions are somehow like totally, uh, our artistic preferences are totally separate from all of our moral decisions. He's like, no, actually, what you like is actually indicative of your own morals. And so he basically says, what art you like is actually a really serious business, which I love, but that quote seems to be distilling that into a really, you know, a condensed version so I'm, I'm, I'm totally here for that. Yeah. No, I love that. That's so good. This has been super fun just yeah. getting to talk about. I think, you know, I was thinking about this. I feel like it'd be really fun to have you back on another time just to talk about a topic and just dive in. Because I know you listen to your faithful listener of the show and like have had so many, I've had so many interesting conversations with you about these kind of things. It would be super fun to uh, just have you on and like talk about something that's on our minds, whether it's a quote of the week like that or just yeah. something that's on your mind. Oh, 100%. 100% I'm down. Yeah, there's been so many times. Like I was about to ask you guys questions, and I was like, ah, oh, it's an interview. I'd just love to be a guest <laughs> like podcaster, you know? So totally. definitely yeah, have me on because like, I'm going I'm to ask good questions. I'm going to, you know, I want to be a part of it. We'll call the bullpen. <laughs> we'll be like, send in the bullpen, send in call. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Love that. Man, well, thank you guys so much for having me on. I appreciate yeah. it a lot. You know, like, I think this is my first interview ever. Where can people go to learn more about you? And what is one thing that listeners can do to help you? Man, well, follow me on Instagram at Cole Isaac. Uh, the O is a zero. And pre-save my new song that I got coming out May 5th. Biggest way you can support is follow me and... Uh, and pre-save the links that are in my bio. Awesome. Dude, thanks so much for being on. This has been a blast. This has been awesome. Yeah, awesome conversation. Real pleasure. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on the show. Um, like I said, like you guys said, I'm a big fan. I listen to you guys all the time. And uh, yeah, excited to, you know, open the podcast up to my audience, hopefully. So yeah, yeah. Appreciate I got, it. yo, huge shout out to everybody who follows me on Spotify. I just hit 500 uh, Spotify followers on. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So like, that's insane. That's insane. Cause that's like 500 people that, you know, when I drop a song, it's going in your release radar and your playlist. So man, thank you to everybody who's subscribed on Spotify. That's another way you can help support subscribe on Spotify or Apple music, Definitely. whatever you use. Check out the links below. Follow Cole on Instagram, follow him on Spotify or Apple music. And make sure you pre-save the music that comes out soon. Yeah. May Thanks 5th. again, man. This was awesome. Hey, thanks for listening to The Craft with Carter and Colby, where we share what we're learning about the creative process. If you're a writer, music producer, marketer, filmmaker, photographer, or you just love creativity, then this show is for you. Our cover art was designed by Elizabeth Newell. You can learn more about her work at elizabethnewelldesign.com. That's Elizabeth n-e-w-e-l-l design.com and you can follow her on instagram at elizabeth is a designer if you like the show there's three things you can do to help us out first subscribe so you learn when we post new episodes 
Second, send the link to one of your friends who you think would enjoy the show. Uh, really, word of mouth is going to be the, the number one way we grow the show in any way. And three, if you have a topic you want us to cover or feedback about how we can improve the show or comments on what we've said, you can respond to heycraftpodcast at gmail.com, H-E-Y-C-R-A-F-T podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.